Hello, everyone. Are we ready? Just gonna do a little bit of pinning. Well, shall we go? Hi everyone, my name is Blair Fornwald and I'm director curator of the School of Art Gallery. On behalf of the gallery, I am so pleased to welcome you all to this evening's virtual lecture, Reciprocal Landscapes, Stories of Material Movements with Jane Ma Hutton. This talk is being held in conjunction with the gallery's current exhibition, Moving Matter Between Rock and Stone, organized by guest curator, Abigail Ald. Moving Matter is up at the School of Art Gallery's main and lobby galleries until October 14th, and I encourage all of you who can to come and visit if you are able. Uh, for those who may be listening only, um, I am a white person in my early 40s. I've got short brown hair and it's in a mullet. Um, I'm wearing eyeglasses and uh, a green sweater. Um, I am speaking to you from my office at the School of Art Gallery, which is located on Treaty 1 territory. This is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. Treaty 1 took territory from seven Anishinaabe First Nations to make the land available for settler use and ownership. Our water in Winnipeg comes from Shoal Lake 40 First Nation, which only last year ended its own boil water advisories with the opening of its centralized water treatment facility. This exhibition, Moving Matter, asks us to think deeply about many issues, including the lasting impacts of resource extraction and settler colonial nation building. In thinking about these histories, this place and this material, we must also acknowledge that the harms of settler colonialism are not behind us, they are ongoing, systemic, socially, culturally, and ecologically devastating and deeply embedded in institutions like ours. Important conversations like this can be catalysts that deepen and share, that deepen our shared commitment to move forward in partnership with indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration as we work together to dismantle, decolonize, and build better alternatives that serve all of our communities. Before I turn it over to Abby, who will introduce tonight's speakers and our colleagues at the Faculty of Architecture, I want to acknowledge that the School of Art Gallery is generously supported by the University of Manitoba, the School of Arts faculty and staff, donors and volunteers. This exhibition and its related programming have received additional funding from the Canada Council for the Arts and the Manitoba Arts Council. Thank you so much to our ASL interpreters for helping make this panel more accessible. And uh, thank you also to School of Art staff, Justin Baer uh, and Kaylin Harrison for their assistance in facilitating this talk. If anybody is having trouble with Zoom, please direct, uh, direct message Justin um, and uh, he will do his best to help you out. And if you're watching on YouTube and have a question, you can post it over there and then we will relay it um, to Jane here on Zoom. Um, of course, I want to extend my sincere gratitude to the Faculty of Architecture for co-hosting this talk, to Jane Ma Hutton for making the time to be with us tonight, and to Abigail Ald for curating this thoughtful exhibition and all of its ancillary programming. Um, Abigail Ald is a writer and curator whose work considers human-altered environments. Her research explores how systems of power and relation are reflected in the way that buildings and cities are constructed with a particular interest in the relationship between urban environments and the ecosystems that sustain them. Abigail holds an MA in cultural studies uh, with a focus on curatorial practice from the University of Winnipeg and a bachelor of environmental design from OCAD University. She lives in Winnipeg, Manitoba here on Treaty One territory and is a descendant of British Canadian settlers Abigail is also a founding member of Parameter Press, which is a collective publishing risograph printed artist editions. And she is currently writing a nonfiction manuscript about Tyndall Limestone. 
I would also like to turn your attention to another virtual discussion that we will be hosting in conjunction with Moving Matter next Thursday evening at the same time. Uh, this one's titled Material Intimacies, Stories in Stone. And it will feature presentations by Moving Matter exhibiting artists, Vanessa Higgin and Trisha Wozni, along with a historian who is the author of Authorized Heritage, Place, Memory, and Historic Sites in Prairie Canada, um, Robert Coots. Uh, you can visit humanitoba.ca slash art slash moving dash matter for more details on that. Um, and finally, I want to thank all of you for coming here to share this virtual space with us tonight. And um, now I'll turn it over to Abby. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Blair, for the, for the introduction and for contextualizing the exhibition um, in relation to the institution and this territory. And thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, I'd also like to uh, thank the artists in Moving Matter, without whom there'd be no exhibition, and echo Blair's, Blair's thanks to the staff and contract workers who have helped realize and maintain the exhibition and adjunct programming throughout its run. In addition to the gallery support, Moving Matter is made possible with, by project grants from Canada Council for the Arts and the Manitoba Arts Council, with Max funding specifically enabling this virtual programming series. A special thank, thank you to Gillis Corries Limited and the Winnipeg Architecture Foundation for supporting my research and to the Winnipeg Arts Council for enabling the project's early development. So today's lecture by Jane Mahutton is co-presented with the Faculty of Architecture at the University of Manitoba as part of its 50th anniversary of the Department of Landscape Architecture from 1972 to 2022. Thank you to Jason Chong and Brandy O'Reilly for facilitating this and to our colleagues from the Faculty of Architecture who will kick off the discussion following Jane's presentation. Leanne Muir, Instructor in Environmental Design and Landscape Architecture. Ben Godis, Landscape Architecture student and Owen swandowski Yerix, Co-op student in the Landscape and Urbanism stream. We also, as I mentioned, welcome questions typed into the chat, uh, both on Zoom and YouTube throughout the evening and then we'll circle back to those at the end of the presentation. I'm now just going to give a quick overview of the related exhibition um, before introducing tonight's speaker. Moving Matter Between Rock and Stone features work by 13 contemporary artists who consider the transformation of a regional bedrock ridge into the recognizable model building stone, building material Tyndall stone. The artists in Moving Matter lead a reorientation toward this material, offering ways to consider the resonance imbued in human rock relations through construction or otherwise, as well as the implications of transforming bedrock into a building material. For every block of Tyndall stone shipped afar, there is a local match in reverse, the mirror of what has been built reflected in deepening voids within the specific area's bedrock. In ghostly silhouette, the hollows of these tiered open pit quarries reflect the volume of construction elsewhere. So while moving matter considers the connection between a specific bedrock formation and its material shed, um, I'm thrilled to be introducing Jane Marhattan tonight, who will refocus our attention toward um, different uh, material flows that link urban development to interconnected sites of material production, both near and far. Uh, Jane Marhattan teaches landscape architecture at the University of Waterloo School of Architecture. Her research focuses on the expanded social and ecological relationship, eco, ecological relationships of the act of building by examining the, the movement of materials as they pass from production landscapes through design constructions, from maintenance through demolition and disposal or reuse. Recent books include Reciprocal Landscape, Stories of Material Movements, Landscript 5, Material Culture, Assembling and Disassembling Landscapes, and Wood Urbanism from the Molecular to the Territorial, co-edited with Daniel Ibanez and Kielmo. Jane, your work is disorienting in the best of ways by revealing how place is co-created through interconnected sites and landscapes and by the hands of labor across complex commodity change, chains, your scholarship remaps the borders of construction and design practice, charting new recognition of the movements and actions that collectively shape environments. This is hugely inspiring to my deep research of one particular material flow 
And I know it has been intellectually expansive for many people in the audience and beyond. So on that note, please join me in extending a warm wel virtual welcome to Jane Mahutton, who I'll hand things over to now. Uh, thank you, Jane, for sharing your work tonight. Thank you so much, Abby, and everybody. Um, it's really a pleasure to join you in Winnipeg and, um, and also to participate kind of alongside this really beautiful, amazing exhibition that I wish I could see, but I've been able to, um, you know, pour through the catalog and just really inspired by the work. Um, and I think maybe the point of intersection for is that I'm also sharing this kind of focus about looking at this, the moment between what's rock and stone um, and the kind of interest in seeing continuities between construction materials and landscapes. Um, and so my plan is to share a couple of the story, material stories from the Reciprocal Landscapes book um, with you and talk about specifically about fertilizer and trees. Um, and hopefully those kind of resonate with, with the ideas that are in this amazing show. So I will share my screen. Just let me know if we have any issues and now it should be full screen. Yeah, good. Um, and um, just thinking about, I, I've only been to Winnipeg once um, and was actually at the train station. And it was, it was nice to see in Evan Collis's beautiful drawing um, and to kind of realize that, that that station is also made out of Tyndall stone. Um, but thinking about how the university where many of you are is you know, related, is connected to the Red River. Um, I'm thinking about how the university where I am is also connected to the Grand River, which passes by. Um, in Cambridge, Ontario. And so this is the school and the Grand River. Um, and here's a, a drawing on the left-hand side of the Grand River as the kind of backbone of the Haldeman Tract, which was um, granted in 1784 and promised by the Crown to the Six Nations of the Grand River uh, forever. And on the right-hand side, you can see in red the area um, that's currently kind of under, under the control of the Six Nations. Um, and the, the rest of the tract has really become, um, is a kind of major urban area. And most of this land was sold off by the crown. Um, and in the last several years, um, there has been, um, for the last few years, Haudenosaunee land defenders blocked a new housing development on the tract known as 1492 Landback Lane. And last year, um, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy Chiefs Council called for a moratorium on development in the whole tract um, for any new construction without consultation with the intention to exercise jurisdiction of land and waters to stop resource exploitation, protect waterways and privilege land stewardship. And so this is, I think, relevant because it's where I'm working, um, but also an extremely clear statement about um, uh, about a real a real demand as we're talking about uh, land material extraction and development and how they're related. Um, so here is the the kind of party of this reciprocal landscapes book, and I'm looking at these five different construction materials: fertilizer, granite, steel, trees, and hardwood. And uh, I'm looking at all of these different cases that ended up where these materials ended up in well loved public landscapes in New York City actually in Manhattan. Um, and in each case, I'm examining the relationship between, you know, a place where the a material came from and where it ended up um, and trying to find a relationship uh, and, and kind of tell a story of how those things, which are seem very separate, are actually very related. And these cases span about 150 years and, and they um, reflect changes in economic regimes, labor practices, design agendas, as well as public attitudes about, you know, what's good design? What does it have to do with resource exploitation? What does it have to do with nature, um, et cetera? So in these different cases, there's a few different things I'm trying to do. One of them, the first is to try to see materials not as commodities, which I find very difficult to do, um, but to think about how they are in fact continuous with the landscapes that they come from, with the livelihoods and habits habitats of people and other species. And I think that th those themes are so amazingly, um, I see that in so many of the, the project projects in this exhibition. 
Um, and so, yeah, just trying to see these materials in as, in as many forms and roles as possible. The second agenda is to try to see how these seemingly unrelated faraway places are really co-created, how, um, you know, toxic deposition in one place means refined materials kind of that that improve quality of life for other people in another place. And then third, um, I wanted to see how these material movements relate to design agendas. So how do the ideas and the concepts that designers intend map onto the real relationships of material production? So I'm gonna talk about two of these, the fertilizer chapter here, and then the street tree chapter over there. Kind of a curveball, not talking about stone, because maybe there's so much, so much stone going on. Um, so yeah, these are the different cases that I look at in the book. Um, and so the first chapter is looking at how, um, as cities were expanding and farms began to industrialize in the 19th century, farmers, and that includes, um, Frederick Law Olmsted in, in, in Central Park, um, began to experiment with processed and different foreign fertilizers. And in this chapter, I'm looking at guano from coastal Peru. This is in the, in the 1860s. Um, and coastal Peru was really a critical source for this new, really important fertilizer. So the chapter looks at this growing metabolic rift of urban centers. Um, as people were starting to be really worried about how about their local organic cycles being disconnected from the from the land that they were on. Um, and the connection to the guano trade links to soil exhaustion, a new form of Pacific slavery, and the kind of lineage that gets us to the the, the modern chemlon that's everywhere. So the as Central Park was being developed, there were fertilized, all kinds of fertilizers were being used, um, ranging from materials that were already found on site to those that were increasingly concentrated, produced, purchased, and, and foreign. And so this, you know, the real conception of the project was a glimpse of country life for urban residents that were now kind of estranged from, from the farms and um, these kind of pastoral landscapes were concealing the surrounding city to try to to try to give people this kind of you know calm um, remediative effect of the of the pastoral landscape, and also sheep were considered to be kind of object lessons for kids who would would never really be able to see them anymore, but the sheep were also um, you know playing an important role fertilizing the grounds, um, munching on the grass, keeping them you know short short um, grazing short and producing this really tough turf and then of course also fertilizing with their with their droppings um, and this is a, a quote from Olmsted um, describing how significant this like perfect perfect smooth rolled um, grass was for the kind of overall aesthetic um, and the kind of success of, of this park so at the same time, this was kind of like a symbol of a, of a farm. It really was also a kind of farm because it was cycling um, manures from the city as the city is growing through it actively. So there's a ton of horse manure everywhere. It's like a major municipal dilemma. Um, there's fermentation, manure fermentation lots. So, that, so people are bringing this manure to Central Park and it's being kind of uh, fermented and then folded into the landscape. There's also night soil. Um, so human waste is being collected. This is pre-sewer. So being collected and fermented in the park as well. Um, and so there's a lot of kind of local organic cycling, but there's also, um, you know, new, tempta new, new temptations to, to start to bring in more high, highly produced um, manures and, and fertilizers from outside. And this is George Waring, who is the architectural engineer of Central Park, talking about how, you know, like really reinforcing the importance of, of local organic cycling. But at the time, the city's expanding rapidly. Um, agriculture is starting to get larger and more industrialized. And um, there are a lot there, there starts to become a lot more dependence and interest in fertilizers that are not so heavy and wet and, and um, not transportable as horse manure. And so there's, there starts to be a lot of interest in um, more processed 
fertilizers. So this is this is um, poudrette, so human manure that's been dried and given a kind of nicer name and and added um, and kind of uh, with with clay added. But it was really um, Peruvian guano that was a a kind of game changer in this this like new whole set of fertilizers that were being used um, because it was just incredibly um, effective, incredibly productive, very, um, you know, highly concentrated. Um, it was kind of a mineral, but it was also a manure. Um, and so, and it was a foreign product, but it was also possible to view it kind of as an extension of the local waste cycle. Um, so there was a cut, it was an interesting moment when there's a lot of discussion about like what it what really is our, what's our local cycle, what's our organic cycle. Um, and here you can see uh, the German chemist um, von Liebig really warning everybody that if you think you can just start to purchase your, if you, if you really start to think about the organic cycle as something that you import and purchase, then we're really in trouble. <laughs> we're gonna really kind of get disconnected um, from, from the, the, the essence of life essentially. Um, and so Liebig goes on to influence Karl Marx's theory of social metabolism and the, this idea about a metabolic rift. Um, but Guano kind of interestingly plays, uh, is like a, this key figure in this um, expansion of, of the metabolism of urbanization at this time. And so this is a, a a little snippet from Olmsted's specification of, of a tiny little bit of guano going into Central Park's first kind of fields. Um, and it's a very small amount. It's like absolutely trace compared to the whole project. But I, I think it's notable because it reflects uh, Olmsted's, you know, his status as an agronomist. He's really interested in cutting edge agricultural practices and guano was really it at that moment. Um, so it's kind of like an experimental application, I would say. Um, but when he's specifying guano, he was also doing this from, you know, professional curiosity and his own experience as a, as an agronomist. Um, he would have heard about its successful use in Britain and other urbanizing regions, but he also was, uh, working on this book, um, Journey in the Seaboard Slave States with remarks on their economy was being published around the same time. And so, um, you know, generations of intensive cash crop farming, like everywhere in, in the country and in Britain, were leaving soils throughout the American South totally exhausted and depleted. Um, agricultural production was down, and this was, was absolutely politically key for the South, for the kind of desire to, for secession and the control over the right to enslave, to maintain slavery. Um, and so plantation owners, like as Olmsted is going and kind of interviewing plantation owners, and they're referring to guano as this potentially saving grace, a way to rapidly improve soil and allow for, you know, this, their political and economic power. Um, and in their language, they were, they were kind of comparing guano and the work of enslaved people. So they're, you know, both were adding value to the fields, but guano's strength was, you know, it had never been seen before and slavery was was vulnerable to kind of being abolished. Um, and this is a, a, a drawing from that, um, that book. So this is the uh, quote from the abolitionist um, Frederick Douglass's newspaper reporting about a new form of slavery happening uh, in the Chinja Islands in Peru where guano was being extracted. And he's, he's talking about, or they, this is an editorial talking about this new kind of frightful uh, horrific form of slavery in the Pacific. So I reached out to um, to the Peruvian Environmental Protection Agency and Junior uh, Patel here offered to accompany me. And so we went, <clears throat> uh, this is along the coast, kind of off the coast of uh, Pisco, Peru. Uh, and we saw these very shallow profiles of some of uh, some of these small islands. And I had seen these islands before in this beautiful lithograph from the 1860s. Um, but you can see that the, the profile is very different. It's a lot, a lot higher here. And essentially that difference is just the guano, a guano, massive, massive guano accumulation that existed in the 1860s. And on the right here, you can see this quote from a naturalist uh, from New York City who's describing the Chincha Islands at this moment 
where there's just a total cacophony of sea life, um, plant, uh, sea life, uh, seabird life. Um, there are uh, thousands of, of Chinese forced workers, um, scores of steel hulled ships bound for New York City, Baltimore and European ports are kind of swarming um, the islands at this time. Um, and so when we arrived, Jorge Paredes um, was the one is, is living alone there. So he's somebody who is um, working for the environmental agency, monitoring bird populations and making sure there's no poaching or industrial fishing going by, going happening nearby. Um, and the island has really <clears throat> been basically abandoned for almost a century. Um, and the birds, the bird populations have slowly started to kind of regain um, numbers. And you can see some of these older buildings there that are kind of under, uh, been reoccupied. Um, and in the writing, I'm looking at the basis of this accumulation. And this is a diagram of the Humboldt current, which causes the upwelling of debris along the coast of Peru. So this like feeds tons and tons of, of uh, fish, especially anchovies, and this becomes the you know the basis of this incredibly rich seabird population. And it's also a place where there's no rain, so it just so happens that there's this kind of magical climatic condition here um, that allows for this kind of uh, steady accumulation of guano. <clears throat> and you have a many species that are actually producing the guano, but it's the guanic uh, cormorant that's you know, very dominates here. Um, and these are guane nests. So this is really thick. What you see are these, you know, these round areas are each uh, a kind of nest. So this is thick white excrement is kind of built up year after year. And so it's not only the excrement, it's also, you know, the, the bones and bodies of birds and sea lions, um, carcasses that kind of get cemented on top and on top and on top. And as they, you know, as the pressure weighs down, this like very heterogeneous material or matter becomes quite homogeneous and becomes this incredibly um, rich material that is wonderful fertilizer. And so you can think about it in section and kind of think about this almost like a glacier where there's the, the bedrock is fixed and then the, the guano kind of has this ability to move. And in this northern Chincha Island, um, at some points, the, the guano um, accumulated to about 150 feet high at about an inch per year, you know, per year. So they, there are estimates that it was about almost a 2000 year accumulation at the time that the, the harvesting began, industrial harvesting began. So essentially this, um, this like incredible ancient accretion um, turned into this lucrative uh, material stockpile pretty much overnight as guano started becoming um, very highly valued. And Peru, uh, who was indebted to Britain because of its support in, Ber in Peru's struggle for independence, uh, ended up granting a British company sole distribution rights for all of this guano. Um, and so while it had accumulated for millennia, these, these islands were cleared really just in a, in a few de short decades. <clears throat> and wherever urbanization thrived and modern agriculture demanded concentrated foreign fertilizers, these shipments were going there. And so even just to give you a sense, in, a, in about 1860, guano accounted for 43% of the fertilizers used in the US, which is pretty mind blowing. So this material is pretty inert when it's solid, but when you harvest it, um, you're picking at it and it gets pulverized and it produces this very caustic cloud of kind of with each stroke of particulate matter. And this is very, very um, kind of toxic for lungs and eyes and mouth. So nobody, nobody wants to do this work. Um, and the work was essentially done by Chinese workers who had been contracted under false conditions of free labor um, and basically arriving at the Chincha Islands enslaved. So Peck, the naturalist uh, who was writing before said that estimated there were, when he visited in I think 64, there were seven or 800 Chinese workers on the island. And he described frequent suicides of workers as people jumped off the island to kind of escape this horrendous 
conditions. And so essentially, um, at the time, both Britain and Peru had already abolished slavery and the US abolition was nearing, um, but the entire this entire British slave apparatus was essentially redirected from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Um, and so by, by basically relocating workers to isolated harsh working conditions like the Guano Islands, these companies could wield power um, that was that was otherwise illegal in this so-called post-slavery context. So thousands of people kind of lived and, and died in these conditions. Um, and you can see this drawing describing this, um, the, the Pacific slavery apparatus kind of redirected. Um, and so guano fever really raged in the US and Europe. Farms were getting bigger, cities were getting bigger. Um, and, the US uh, in 1856 passes the Guano Islands Act, which basically grants US citizens the, the right to occupy uninhabited islands that contain guano deposits, and many did. Um, and so this is Baker's Island was one of those islands that was claimed, and there are more than 60 islands in the Pacific Islands, um, as well as 40 others in the Atlantic and Caribbean. So the, the Guano Island story, the, you know, the, the Guano Age is very short. It was essentially completely eradicated, like completely um, extracted over a few short decades um, and ended abruptly as Chile took control of Peru and Bolivia's nitrate reserves, steering the world's fertilizer markets towards nitrates. And so, you know, basically its depletion was inevitable. Um, and this led to the development of the Haber-Bosch process the synthetic production of ammonia from atmospheric nitrogen, which we all, you know, all know and eat um, every day um, as the basis of the modern industrial food, you know, food uh, production. But also I think um, the parallel landscaping industry. So, which we could also see in contemporary central parks. So I think this is a for me a reminder of how the the kind of stories of the industrialization of agriculture and the industrialization of landscape of kind of uh, horticulture and landscaping are so closely paired. Um, and so these, you know, the toxic chemicals behind the these lush lawns are something that is a well-recognized contradiction of the modern landscapes. Um, and today, this is a map showing the Chincha Islands, but also this kind of larger archipelago of the Peruvian coast, which <clears throat> promotes a small amount of sustainable harvest of guano for domestic use in organic farming. Um, and these are um, the, the team kind of look, kind of tending um, the Chincha Islands. And they talk about wanting to bring, you know, hoping that the program might bring tourism to the region, um, which they is required to support their conservation efforts. But they're also very wary of the environmental pressures that tourism can bring and what, what that might mean for the bird populations as well. Um, so really, you know, the, the kind of history of the Chincha Islands guano landscapes, um, the kind of decimation of the bird populations and the, this kind of horrific labor condition of forced labor were, were these unseen consequences of this modernization of agriculture and the urban regions that it supported. And Central Park is really just a kind of um, instance, I think, where that plays out within you know, this, this kind of canon of landscape architecture. So that's, um, that's the first uh, story in the book. And then I'm gonna share one more. Um, which is about, which is the fourth chapter, which is about London plane trees and a, um, a community driven planting of London plane trees on 7th Avenue in Harlem and the Rikers Island tree nursery where they grew up. Um, not this one's a very much closer distance kind of production landscape, very close by, but, but, but at a distance. So this chapter, um, focuses on Platinus acerifolia, the beautiful London plane tree, um, really well known and loved for this <clears throat> camouflage bark and the ball shaped fruit and their, their incredible resilience to urban conditions. 
Um, and so by the mid century, they were New York City Parks Department's favorite tree was they were planting it everywhere because they were hardy against soot traffic and and kind of made, you know, made this glorious canopy over the sidewalk. Um, and so in the in the writing, I'm looking at the how the street trees are kind of serving as an indicator species of the urban landscape. So they're reflecting ideas about the city's health. They're, you know, they're alive, they need care to survive, but at the same time, they also provide for people's survival and health. They provide shade, ambient, you know, they cool the temper, the, the air, they filter particles, and these are all a function of their own vitality. So it's a kind of way to think about the interconnection of, of, residents and, and the trees that are also residing there. Um, and I think it's, to me, it was interesting and surprising to find out that street trees were not kind of an obvious part of the, um, the commissioner, the commissioner's plan of 1811. Um, trees were instead kind of planted piecemeal one by one. Um, and you know, here you're being encouraged to plant, get together with your neighbors and plant some trees to cooperate. Um, but this map shows uh, certain places where there was a more um, coordinated tree planting. And one of the places where that was happening was north of Central Park um, on 7th Avenue, which was planted with beautiful elms and the street was kind of designed as this grand leafy boulevard. Um, and as the area developed, street widening wiped out the, the, side, the side plantings of 7th Avenue. You can see here in the, in the 50s, um, as, this, as 7th Avenue is becoming a, a really important kind of culture hub. Um, and here women are touching what was known as the wishing tree. It was a tree that was said to give good luck to musicians playing at the jazz clubs on 7th Avenue. And here is an article um, from the 1950s that describes um, the depleted, like the, that the tree canopy across the city was really failing. There were, there, it says there's only 2 million remaining. There are swaths of trees and parks that are coming down by storms uh, because of pollution, because of just like, you know, maybe kids hanging off of them, I'm not sure. Um, but this, the, the urgency, to, like, being described in this at this moment is within a context of uh, kind of mass white flight, disinvestment and kind of a dis discriminatory disinvestment in the urban core, the beginning of, an asso of the association of the city with crime um, and it's a general retreat um, to the suburbs. <clears throat> so many urban residents at the time were working in the face of racially discriminatory policies and unequal municipal services. And so one of them in this neighborhood, uh, you know, in, in Harlem North of um, Central Park is the People's Civic and Welfare Association that was organizing to fight housing, fight for housing, employment, civil services and environmental injustices and, and kind of making arguments about the interrelationship between all of those things. And among, among many other things, um, one of their campaigns was demanding infrastructure upgrades and the replanting of um, 7th Avenue trees. So this photo shows um, 13 years after the, their, the People's Civic and Welfare Association demands were first launched, um, the city committed to a large scale tree planting on 7th Avenue. And so this photo shows the first of 400 London plane trees going in from 110th to 155th Street, so quite all the way up um, on a spring day in 1959. And so all of these trees were going in, they were about eight feet tall when they went in um, and they had spent their first years growing in a tree nursery on Rikers Island, just not very far away, a couple of miles away. So this is Rikers Island from the air. And for 200 years before this point, Rikers had been a really convenient dumping ground for, for New York City as a whole. Um, it had was housing a small jail, a municipal dump and city farm. It had grown from a, 40, a very small 40 acre marshland to uh, a 600 acre island. Um, 
and it was essentially like a quite a large um, landfill. <clears throat> and so as the World's Fair of 1939 was approaching, the dump was seen as a potentially embarrassing for the city because it could be seen and smelled from the World's Fair site in Flushing Bay. And as the city developed a plan to construct this massive jail complex on the dump, uh, the Parks Commissioner, Robert Moses, announced um, the addition of a tree nursery to the plan. So the nursery, the idea here is that the nursery would be run by the Parks Department and would produce a huge supply of affordable street trees, and they, these would be tended uh, entirely by inmates. So in these kind of these newspaper articles, you can see how journalists were playing up the tree production as both a kind of redempt, redemptive story and also a story about place. Um, and so on the one hand, this former dump was gonna be transformed to provide thousands of trees indefinitely to the city, transforming New York from its, you know, this, this idea of it as like a city of stone where nothing can live into one that would be lush with, with life-giving trees. But at the same time, <clears throat> the other story is that the prisoners would have this rehabilitating experience of working with the land, tending and caring for seedlings as a kind of res restorative uh, you know, experience. Um, but this scheme was, of course, very cost effective. And that was really the bottom line, that free incarcerated labor and free land meant that these trees were, would cost about half the cost of private nursery trees. And that they would also importantly be grown to the parks department's um, precise speci specifications. So the dump was leveled and compacted by uh, Works Progress Administration workers and as well as prisoners. Um, they planted cover crops and turned under um, turned them under to build soil. Um, some said that there was a combination because this was a landfill. Um, some people would say that it was the combination of all of that like mixed waste that made this extremely fertile soil base and others described the intense steaming and off gassing from the landfill and how certain areas were too hot for anything to grow. Some people described like spontaneous um, combustion. Um, in the first year, 14,000 street trees were planted and in the second, 30,000 more and everybody was amazed by how well they were doing there. Um, two to 50 prisoners worked at any one time. They were involved in all aspects of the horticultural process from preparing seedlings to pruning and rearing juvenile trees. Um, they were collecting seeds from nearby, from the park system. And mostly the plane trees were really dominating, but there were also American elms and Norway maples. But at the time it really was just a, a very small number of different species. Um, the nursery had extremely specific bio, biophysical conditions. So on top of the landfill, um, uh, so you know, all of the plants were growing on top of the landfill. There were no predators. There was a very diverse bird life and things were relatively quiet there. Um, the news, news reports include um, instances of, you know, a black widow spider infestation, a hurricane that wiped out 4,000 London plane trees. At some point, a plane, an airplane actually plowed through 666 London plane trees. And in 1966, two inmates temporarily escaped capture by hiding between rows of London plane trees for several days. And in this research, I really wasn't able to speak with anyone who had worked there while they were incarcerated. Um, but people who worked in the nursery were quoted with saying that, you know, sometimes that they liked this work, that it was one of the few opportunities to be outside um, and ha having the satisfaction of seeing the trees grow was a positive aspect. Um, but I think it's really important to recognize that the system functioned, you know, this, this, this whole um, project really functions, functioned based on free or cheap, cheap labor. On Rikers in the 1950s, inmates weren't paid at all. Um, and by the 1980s, nursery workers were said to make only 50 cents per hour. So this practice in general is um, what Michelle Alexander describes in the new Jim Crow is, is really um, a direct continuation of the legacy of slavery. 
So over the 1980s, with the city's racially discriminatory so-called war on drugs, Rikers population exploded. Um, and this essentially meant that the, the nursery had to be closed. And so some of it was moved to Van Cortlandt Park, not too far away. So you can see here the, the complex overtaking all of the island. Um, and this is Robert Zappala, who was one of the last parks workers um, to close the nursery and move it, move it off of the island. Um, so today the parks procure street trees from private nurseries in Long Island. So rather than growing a few species like London plane trees, they plant over 200 species. And there, it's an interesting also change in terms of how the parks department sees street trees, really thinking about the city as made up of many eco zones rather than being like a single, you know, concrete wasteland. <clears throat> And so Matt Stevens, who was the director of street trees at the time, told me that the parks really recognize street trees planting as a social equity issue. Um, so citizens with fewer trees have increased respiratory illnesses and historically poor municipal services. And there are many attempts to address this, but they're unbearably slow. Um, and so there's a, a well-known movement uh, to close Rikers and this, you know, this complex, which is really notorious um, for, you know, incredible violence and just like a total breakdown of social systems um, is seen as a symbol of the criminal justice system as a whole corrupt and beyond reform. Uh, there are lots of plans and lots of different kind of, there have been different design competitions <clears throat> talking about how this site could be reimagined and, and often they include a new kind of park, um, including often some kind of urban farm or some, some form of horticulture. Um, and I think, I believe that this is the tree that was planted on that day, the, the London plane tree that was planted on that day in 1959. And I think about half of the trees planted on, on 7th Avenue from roughly that, that age seem to be still around. Um, and in other parts of Harlem residents um, identify <clears throat> struggling against so-called green gentrifications where, where Ironically, tree plantings and neighborhood improvement projects are seen as indicators of displacement to come and the kind of rising cost of, of housing and, and um, gentrification. And this is um, the artist Jill Hubley's map, which shows street trees by species. It's, a, it's an online application. You can kind of go in and <clears throat> play with it. Um, and you can choose different species, but here I've chosen the London plane tree in orange, and there are 90,000 of them. And it's really not possible to know which ones were grown on Rikers Island, but it's likely that much of this mature canopy today was supplied by the nursery over the 45 years that it was in operation. And I think this is to me like a very amazing image because it reminds both of the incredible amount of labor and care of, in this case, of unpaid workers and community advocates and parks workers that has gone into this, you know, incredible ambience that, that these trees make in the city. Um, and so while it's often, you know, we often kind of tend to focus on these heroic development myths, the city really is this collective uh, construction. So that's, that's kind of the conclusion of that um, that story, and I, maybe I'll just leave it there. I think I think for me, um, yeah, the the questions driving the book really are just this a desire to um, have this a thought experiment of of trying to visualize these connections that are we kind of know are there, but are actually hard to hard to grasp grasp or see. Um, and to try to imagine what, you know, understanding these, you know, what's considered an externality of development or design um, and how, how, you know, those externalities could, could become more, more internal um, and that we might think about, you know, how material practices are more in solidarity with these other places and people. So I'll, I'll I'll stop there and I'll stop sharing. So thanks so much for, for um, listening.
and I'm looking forward to, to talking with everybody. Thank you, Jane. Um, thank you very much for going for um, going kind of into de into depth on two um, two of the chapters of the five. Um, I was finding my and going through my notes notes of the, the book today. I was realizing I was like, oh, but then there's this thing and these other the um, other stories. So I encourage everyone if you haven't um, had a chance to read the book, um, it's at the, in the library at the U of M School of Architecture Library and in bookstores too. There, there's some really great other stories. And um, just anecdotally, I was thinking, I've been thinking in the last uh, couple of weeks, we're, we're in the kind of two week period in Winnipeg where the leaves are changing and then we'll have no leaves probably by next week. Um, but I've been, I was reminded that I am, I look at trees differently having heard the, read the story about plane trees. And I had, it's once you explained and went through that carefully, the tending um, and care that in, goes into nursery work. And that particularly in this, the story of trees grown on Rikers Island, the contrast against the care for the incarcerated people um, doing that labor, um, but that all that happens and that can, contributes to this, you know, these straight trees. We have, Winnipeg has a great elm canopy. Um, and to think and now it's, I mean, it's once you explain that, it's so obvious that um, that that the these trees that seem like they uh, that there's so much care that goes into them, they are um, changed by that 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 care ahead of time, and, and have those these tall um, uh, stalks that allow it to go over. Um, yeah, the trees. Anyway, um, I think I'm going to maybe pass it pass the screen over to Leanne to get a, um, a discussion going. Yeah, thanks, Leanne. <laughs> Abby, thanks, Jane. That was fantastic. And I'd have to say, since I first um, found your book, or since it first crossed my path, it has stayed probably on my desk the whole time, and it hasn't made its way to the bookshelf. So I've been really inspired by it, both in the teaching um, that I do, and just thinking about, you know, my own decisions in practice. Um, and, you know, I think that, you um, this work was obviously incredibly challenging because you're digging through a world that's intentionally opaque in many ways. Um, and I think that if we look at like food and fashion, they've both sort of had their reckoning in a way where there are some like really, where they're having their reckoning, we could say, like if we think about slower food movements and slower fashion movements and like movements towards transparency to allow consumers to be a little bit more educated, that really hasn't happened, um, you know, beyond some standardized, I would say, um, system regulations that we have for materials, but it's less, I would say, about that social ecological connection. And so I wonder in your mind, like if you think about where you started with this work and the work that you might be doing now, what you might envision, or, you know, if you could sort of dream into what you hope could happen for materials for, for those of us who work in architecture, who specify materials, oftentimes on short timeframes mm -hmm. and budgets, like how could you imagine our system changing a little bit to allow for some um, intentional transparency versus, you know, intentional opacity mm -hmm. and not really just towards like where the material comes from, but that really clear social ecological connection, which I think you really um, get at so beautifully in the work that you've done. And, and you really um, brought in that conversation to, to illustrate the depth of it. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think it's uh, I think it's very hard. Like uh, as a, I, I always struggle with this kind of like direct translation um, because it's it's so complicated. I think. Um, I mean, I guess a first start, like for me, a first start is even like one um, a report that came out by Grace Farms. Um, I don't know if that you've come across that, uh, which is about forced labor practices in the construction or in, in in many industries but including the construction industries 
that I think came out a couple of years ago. And I think like f- for me, I'd never seen any, you know, I really hadn't been hearing about that at all. So I guess the first step is really just even to, to, for all of us to try to get more into, into awareness about, about, um, you know, the, the depth and intensity of the problems. Um, I think, um, I mean, I think when, when you talk about food and fashion, I think that's how it started, right? Like, I think it starts, it does, like you're saying, there's, there's maybe not as much awareness. And so I think in both of those movements, they're like how many projects and how many people and how many organizations, you know, work for kind of decades to, to get the ball rolling. So I think that's happening now, but I, I guess I think, yeah, it, it's a huge cultural, uh, it needs to be kind of like a huge cultural attention Mm-hmm. Um, because there are not, because whenever we kind of jump to, to like the silver bullet, it's always, it's always totally problematic. You know, like there's no, there's kind of no easy way out. Like we know in this world, which is like deeply, deeply unfair and deeply, um, you know, functions the way it does because of these in, incredible inequities. So there's kind of no, um, like special place that we just haven't, you know, special perfect way to kind of mm-hmm. get extraction and everybody's good. Um, but I do think, yeah, so I do think like the I wonder about how how that becomes much more a part of the discussion in schools. Um I think it's I find it really interesting. Also when I think about fashion um uh in architecture schools, I think about deconstruction or like the the way that I think everybody is is trying to think about a shift from a kind of new material paradigm to like the the extant, you know, what is here? How is that a creative creative work to be done, to to be working with deconstruction um, and adaptive to all kinds of different adaptive practices. So I think I think there's a lot of models there to to work from. But the, yeah, that's even a huge, a huge culture shift, I think. Um, but they're all coming from, I think, asking the same types of questions yeah. about where things are coming from and where things are going. And I mm-hmm. think that what's beautiful about your book is that you you ask those questions and you really, really follow the the wormholes, I would say, which, um, you know, it's it's really challenging to do that because it is, like I'd mentioned before, almost intentionally opaque yeah yeah Um, and that's what I think makes it challenging you know beyond looking local and working local which is always um um a great way to start so so yeah I think that that's you know asking better questions can I ask you how you how you're doing it or like I think for, for me you know I teach um, second year ecology and design in Mm -hmm. um, environmental design program. Mm -hmm. Um, And part of what I try and get the students to do is just to really like recognize that every, every action has a consequence. Like you're talking about, um, you know, this idea of a reciprocal landscape is such a lovely, lovely way of looking at it, but everything is reciprocal in a way, everything, if it's a push, there's a pull and mm-hmm. every action is connected to something else. And so it's just sort of that awareness, I think, is the f- thing that I try and get mm-hmm. people to think mm-hmm. about and just starting to understand that conversation about systems and how many um, webs there are in mm-hmm. the systems. So mm-hmm. like, I find that that is really exciting to talk about in second year, um, which is really their first year in the design program. So when you're first starting to make decisions about can, you know, what is this and to learn about a material um, to be trying to really question what it is and to then, you know, look even just down at your own desk is yeah. well, this was in zoom times, you know, look down at your desk and what's around you and where, where do you think it came from? Mm-hmm. So those are the conversations that I've been having, but then in my own practice, it's, it's, it's really challenging, you know, trying to um, be, you know, the research is hard to do when you're not 
buying immediately local and it, it's almost impossible. Yeah. So, um, so I think, but that the idea of using like reuse is always obviously there, but that product is still, that material is still coming from somewhere. So even mm -hmm. though you're reusing it, it's, it is still part of that cycle. Mm -hmm. so I don't know. I think they're just really, really fascinating questions. And I mm -hmm. love that you asked them because they, they got me to ask so many more. So, yeah. I don't know if any of, if Ben or um, Owen want to jump in. Yeah, sure, I'll jump in. Um, thanks, Leanne. Thanks, Jane. Um, really, really great talk tonight. Loved hearing your thoughts, um, elaborating more on your reading. Um, I think they're really uh, refreshing stories, ones that you might not hear all the time. Um, specifically related to Tindlestone and made me think about maybe the not so beautiful side of our historic downtown. Um, and then, so with Tindlestone, like many other materials you explored, um, it has this very non-human timeline. And then once its process is whittled down, it's given this human scale and maybe a death date. Um, so hearing about the connection, it kind of made me wonder a little bit more about uh, you know, what does it look, how can, we've done the damage, how can we make the post-process product last even longer um, mm -hmm. to maybe, I don't know, just to get the most out of it. It feels like we should be doing that. Um, so speci specifically speaking to Tindlestone or maybe something you're more familiar with, um, I was wondering what you found maybe culturally limits these materials to being dynamic or what's the biggest roadblock that we face to extending these life cycles? Yeah, that's like a, that's such a important question. I think for all of us right now, I, I'm sure I don't know the answer. <laughs> I don't I'm sure I don't have an easy, uh, a single answer. Um, I mean, I think you use the term death date. That's very interesting, but yeah, I think like, just, are you, are you talking, you're referring to the fact that there's this kind of, um you know extraction to to construction yeah. and then it's yeah. over kind of mentality that's an, yeah like this is another kind of cultural perception mm -hmm. of how this of how materials work like they're in they're in use they're useful and then they're not and i think i think um when you talk to people that are involved in the kind of recycling side of of things they're just like outraged that it's so cheap to landfill stuff um, and that this is kind of subsidized. Um, and so I think if you get into a bit, you know, the economy of how materials can be demolished and, and landfilled, that tells us a lot about their, you know, social value, supposed social value. Um, and so, it's interesting that, yeah, that it, I, I guess that the the disposability has so many, there are so many forces that are making that possible, despite yeah. the fact that probably everybody thinks it's, it's wrong. Yeah. Um, and, and I think this, again, I just think for people that are in, that are like in the design world, this is like such interesting creative work to be done. Like, how do you, yeah, technically, like how, what are the skills required? What is the work required? What, how, how does all of this material get recomposed and reused? I think so many people are working on that, um, but it seems kind of endlessly important, endlessly interesting also. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's, a, it's just such an interesting paradigm shift. Um, yeah. Yeah, I found it. Um... I found it objectively. I mean, it's interesting when you speak to Tindlestone, how the larger it is, the almost the longer life cycle it has huh. and how back in, um, back, back when Winnipeg was developed, it was used pretty heavily and it still is used heavily today and how that's kind of, um, it's, it's kept going through specifications and the way we used to do things. But, um, yeah, I just, really enjoyed your talk today and the exhibition just because it starts to talk about the, the connections. Mm -hmm. and you know unearthing uh you know what 
this looks like, what this really means today. So thank you. Thanks, Ben. Um, we have, uh, if you would like, you can also put uh, questions into the chat box. Um, we may have a question from Suzanne, or I don't know if that's a mistake, uh, Suzanne McLeod. Um, yeah, um, yeah, if you turn on your volume and you can ask a question. Okay, can you, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. hi, Suzanne. Yeah. Hi, hi, Jane. Uh, a wonderful talk. Um, I'm on my tablet. I can barely navigate on my tablet, so I'm <laughs> not going to try and put something into the chat, so I apologize for that. Um, but I wanted to say that uh, such a wonderful talk. Um, it, it's really, this really is new knowledge for me. Um, so I'm a prof um, in Indigenous art history at the School of Art. And so I'm really interested in the materiality um, uh, that you just, you made a, a, a real case for the relationship in between um, time and land, you know. Um, so you, you talked about that and, and the history of it. Um, and I want to say that I know that Winnipeg really takes its pride in in its use of Tyndall stone, you know, and so it it um, it, it raises a question around it for me at least the, this new awareness is um, uh, to question its manufacture because I don't know what the local manufacture is uh, in the Winnipeg context. So, but I was really interested in your talk that you give about uh, guano, you know, and the fact that you actually went out to the island. Uh, and, and saw the island is, is, is just incredible to me. Um, and, and the whole aspect of this was an organic material and it, you know, it was, it was raised up um, organically through nature, you know, and man came along and, and pretty much decimated it along with the, the bird population. And so you spoke about this one person who actually lives on the island and um, the, it, it sounds like environmental tourism is what they're trying to, to mm -hmm. kind of frame it at. And, and to me, even that term environmental tourism is an oxymoron in itself. You know? mm -hmm. It seems like it would be um, one, of the other, one of the other individuals in, in the chat had made this comment about um, that it's still taken out, and you may not be able to answer this, it's still taken out um, under the guise of the fishing industry. Um, and that there is still enslaved, I'm assuming enslaved individuals under, under this um, or, or people who are, are, are taking this out in terms of the, the uh, for the black market, like what markets are, would it be going to in a contemporary? Like, is it still used as a resource? I, you know, maybe, it, maybe Michelle could speak to that. Um... I know that it's being used, it's being harvested. The, the, the accumulation is very, is a lot slower than it used to be because the bird population is not what it used to be. Um, and it, when I was there, they were using it locally. Like they were using it with domestically for organic farming. So there was definitely still some, some harvest. And it was, it's interesting from the, from the worker point of view, like it's still work that nobody wants to do. It's very difficult work and it's still done by hand. And so it's, primarily like migrant laborers from the Andes who come um, to do the work. So it has, it's, it's not, you know, the same, but it's, it's still considered like very undesirable work to be done. Yeah. So I'm not sure about um, maybe, yeah, maybe if Michelle could. Actually, sorry. I, my comment was in response to somebody else's comment oh. and they posted okay. about the enslavement of people through that process. So I was just saying okay. that that's, process continues sorry mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely and uh, it seems like it's it, it would still be dangerous to have one person living on an island especially with what we hear about uh, in terms of uh, resource extraction and uh, industries that are uh, is this within the the um, the territories of Peru or is it beyond into open territory where it's not regulated I think it's part of the yeah it's it's in the territory, as far as I know. Yeah. Of Peru still. Mm -hmm. It's in the water. Of Peru, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. So, I mean, so that's like, a, um, I guess, a political and a social commentary in itself. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a recognition that um, because we always hear uh, 
uh, th this term post-colonial. And so we're really still not uh, in a post-colonial uh, mm -hmm. uh, world yet. Um, and, and so I'm speaking strictly from my own background as a First Nations person, you know, so so when we when we talk about that, um, it, it, we, we're still we're not in a post-colonial uh, mm -hmm. society. Yet. So and then I was really interested about the, the story of, of Rikers Island. Um, I haven't read your book yet, but I'm going to go out and, and I'm going to uh, to pick it up now because it is this is just absolutely fascinating um, from an Indigenous context. I, um, do you write about um, the territories that were there in the New York area um, mm -hmm. before and what the landscape actually looked at looked like? No, I think this was a real a real problem. I didn't. Mm -hmm. I didn't. And I I think um, like I guess it came out a few the book came out a few years ago and it, now I can't believe it, honestly. Like I, I'm I'm I think it's a real failure actually um but no I think that's very that would be like essential yeah yeah, yeah your next book <laughs> yeah absolutely so but I want to thank you absolutely fascinating just uh just a powerful um just an awareness of, of uh, because I'm, I'm not in architecture I'm not in engineering you know, but there's always a consideration of, of the land and the relationship to land and and um, just understand, recognizing more about how we live in these these contemporary buildings. Like I live in a new building. So now I'm looking at my walls going, hmm, I, wonder, <laughs> I wonder where the manufacturer comes from, you know? So, yeah. yeah, I know it's even so much harder. Like everything is so hidden now. It's very, yeah. I just end up spacing out and looking at everything all the time too. Yeah. yeah Thanks absolutely. so much for your comments. I might see, um, Owen, did you have a, were you carefully, are you waiting for it to ask, ask a question? Sure, I can ask my question. Sweet, thanks. Um, thanks, Jane. Okay, so my question is, how would you describe the smell um, on the Chincha Islands? No, I'm joking. That's not my question. Um, <laughs> but I am interested in um, those sites of extraction um and sort of what's left there and it makes me think so right outside of Winnipeg I'm not sure if it's a Tyndall stone quarry but we have sort of like a swimming hole what people know as the pits and it's got like crystal clear water it's like mm -hmm. um, abandoned quarries and it just makes me wonder like in your research have you come across well and also um the want for tourism on the Chincha Islands like have you come across um these like um just like decimated sites of extraction that have been opened up to the public, like maybe even mediated by, say, like a landscape architect? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, as you're saying that, I'm thinking that so much of like the, the profession of land, contemporary landscape architecture really, ha really often, at least in like the last, you know, several decades, has really been focused so much on um, on the transition of industrial space, like so port space, like it might say like a, a lot of the kind of like most well-known practices that we might think of are often industrial factory landscapes, um, contaminated landscapes that have that now have different value often in urban centers um, where there's let's say, you know, like housing nearby or denser population nearby that is going to be using that for for like more concentrated recreation or something like that so I think I actually think it's almost everywhere and as you were describing that I was thinking oh yeah that's actually a huge a huge part of what the profession focuses on I, I did happen in in the in one of the chapters is about granite in Maine and and I think in lots of quarry towns or like, you know, spent quarries are often, they end up being like the swimming holes of the, of the places um, after they're closed, definitely. But I think in maybe more generally um, so much of, or do you think that, do you agree as a landscape architect, do you, do you sense that as well? Or do you have a different take on that? I do, but I think um, I'm almost more interested in like with the least amount of intervention or remediation or anything like that, 
involved like almost as it is mm -hmm. like just like fully like scraped away mm -hmm. like when when there has been a trans like transformation to a different use with very little design you mean sure yeah yeah mm -hmm. um yeah it's a good question i'm only thinking about the yeah kind of I mean, even these quarries are usually off limit. They're usually like perceived to be dangerous in some ways. Like that you're often, you're usually like breaking some rule, yeah. which makes it fun. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, and I think to, to correct the record, or not, it's not correct the record, but clarify things. I think the pits you're talking about are former gravel pits, likely, mm -hmm. just outside the city. Um, and I, yeah, they're not, I think it's not not sanctioned and similarly yes the the not in active use quarries around um Tyndall Garson are um yeah not on on no no trespassing private land um, but there is a the stonewall quarry which is a different um stone on the side of stonewall that quarries north of the city um that were re, um uh turned into a park and landscape so that is uh, that is open. There's an interpreter center. And, um, yeah, so those are um, examples of that. I, I think I in it this is in a, the, the high line is another something that you talk about, Jane in a, in a few sections of the book that I think of this sort of factors in a bit to what you're talking about, Owen of um, although that is a very changed um, uh, or upgraded lands, uh, landscape design, um, the, the aesthetics of it are very much about um, uh, maintaining that um, uh, industrial history and, and sort of mi minimal intervention. Um, and Jane, you go into that a bit about the complications of those kind of, um, um, change that kind of public landscape now that is connected to um that is made possible because of kind of private private buy-in and so it's not necessarily i'm gonna <laughs> um uh, it's public in a different way now that that kind of development so I'm, that's this is in the chapter on epa wood which is used in the first um the first part of the highline would do you, this, uh, would you mind talking a little bit about that or or maybe connecting that to, to Owen's question? Yeah, sure. Um, the, yeah, are you familiar with the, the high line? I guess everybody, everybody knows that one. Yeah. Um, so this was the 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 former elevated West Rail, I'm forgetting the name, um, like up the Hudson River. Um, that's now this kind of super every you know most loved park um and so i guess yeah in that in that chapter which is about the wood this the ipe wood so super durable wood um i'm exploring the theme of kind of obsolesce or you know decay like when things can actually are allowed to decay um and then the obsolescence of this industrial uh infrastructure um and i guess maybe abby you're i'm not sure if i'm missing <laughs> missing the, the point you were thinking of but that's yeah i guess another an example of a kind of like project that has tons of of cultural attention um but is also the is also you know the transformation of an industrial to recreational use yeah, I don't, I think I was <laughs> just triggering to that memory that I didn't necessarily have a point. Um, but I think the thing that I found interesting of your, like, and, and particularly the um, the sort of some articles that you um, referenced in, in the chapter, um, less related to about, about the eBay, because that's kind of like a small, the part of, of how it, of it's, what enables like that, that, that kind of um, uh, like really high end public space mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is a it, it is that the right. society that the the, the kind of um, I don't mean this with a negative connotation but the 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 weight of 
concerned citizens of, uh, or like the citizens group that organized and mm -hmm. um, to be able to, and fundraised for that um, mm -hmm. initially. Um, and, and that, that I think that you like the, just the tension of that is like, it is also, it's something that it, um, both in its original, like the, it, it represents the displacement of um, not, I'm, I'm kind of peddling things, but not necessarily in that moment, but the displacement of working class people from the city. I'm not mm -hmm. talking about it from 2009 on, but that, um, yeah, <laughs> it's a bit incomplete. I, but it really, I saw parallels with in, I, in this isn't necessarily landscape design, but the, um, the the forks, which is a um, 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 a redeveloped railway, so just behind the Union Station where you um, came through the city, is the forks, which was the the rail yard for that, and it was um, re redeveloped in the eighties and nineties, and then has had this resurgence um, and is a is absolutely a very successful place um, and public space to be, but it is a uh, a, a change public public space that is um, as, as you kind of described the the highline that some of the challenges of it like connected to commerce mm -hmm. um, and policed in a different way like than um, yeah uh, it, it's but yeah anyway that and then what was I just thinking of with Recently, something else. Anyway, or thinking or anything local. Yeah. Anyway, that's a bit of a. <laughs> um, let's see. I think we have a bit of a quiet chat, right now, but um, um, I, I don't want to take over to take over the floor too much, but I was curious, kind of delighted in rereading your introduction recently. I had forgotten that you introduced the book with uh, talking about um, uh, Robert's um, business, like talking about artwork. Um, and um, I was curious about how and talking using um, uh, Robert Smithson's site and non-site uh, this uh, artwork as a kind of as a framework for your invest investigation. Um, and this and then really excited to see um, his, his writing about Olmsted and the, and this idea of dialectical thinking um, and that uh, uh, the that that his that that artwork um, which I'm not describing for everyone um, but is creates a dialect di dialogue between both the gallery space and the um, the landscapes um, the quarry landscapes that are so I'm going to ask you maybe to t talk about that mm -hmm. a little bit um, because that was I in retrospect, really connected with that, having spent this time working with artists um, for the exhibition. I don't think, uh, I think it was very, help uh, it was like exciting for me to see that again too, because I don't think I'm able to articulate totally why, but the, but the, uh, this exhibition really felt like I, uh, something that I was needed the help of artists to, to, to figure out this in between. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if, if you maybe could talk about that and kind of talk about dial, uh, dial, dialectical thinking. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I know. I, I can totally imagine that as you're putting together the exhibition, like it's it's also referential. Like you've got you have some pieces of the Tyndall Stone, but it's also everything so much refers to another something else, but but another place that's not actually that far that everyone can kind of imagine. Like, so I, I just imagine mm -hmm. that the, the elsewhere is very present in the, in the yeah. space. And I think, yeah, I find that um, just as a reference, the non Smithson's non-site so clear. I mean, I, I think clear for me, cause I, I, I'm pretty sure I'm missing like a lot of other aspects of that work, but just the, the part of it, which is about, um, trying to not capture, but trying to kind of understand, you know, a geological reality or a extraction site um, and gather pieces of that into this kind of rarefied gallery um, that gets so much attention. 
um, and trying to kind of invert that, trying to think through like, what would it mean? I guess just recognizing, I think as a designer or as a, you know, as a landscape architect, recognizing, oh, I've got so much, all of this cultural emphasis is like, we're all looking in this direction. Like what it what happens if you look in the other direction? Mm -hmm. um, and of course there are lots of other people looking in the other direction. It's just not where I, my positionality is. Um, and so, yeah, just the possibility of inverting, like what that maybe, maybe the, maybe the rarefied public landscape is the kind of gem or the, the, the kind of the place where we're, we're giving so much attention to, but yet it's, it's only as fragment of this kind of much bigger, bigger picture. And I, I guess I really like the, I like it as a, a kind of mental game like it, it means you you can never and I think this is what Smithson gets into in that writing about Olmsted which is that n nothing is a thing in itself like a park is not a park you can't just talk about a park it's never just it's it never like ends at that boundary it's never um it it always refers to its relationships um and I think yeah for me that's just like a, a great reminder <laughs> about everything um, but especially when we're talking about materials that are, are you know, from a place that have relationships. Um, so it's kind of, I guess he, that, that work forces that, you know, like the, there is, there is nothing, we can't only look here ever. Mm -hmm. um, is a, is a good, to me, like a helpful reminder. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that it was pretty cool to see him or in that the article Smith uh, Smithson's writing about Olmsted um, to think of landscape architecture as that as something that can not, not never not not be about somewhere else. Um, and in, uh, and you you know, illustrated that so beautifully in a number of ways. Um, and then I think I can't I can't remember who was I think it's probably probably you but in having said made the connect, connection that material materials are so much in many ways the like and I think and um, raw materials are uh, make it so much easier to which is often um, used in landscape um, to be able to make that connection between um, um, between constructed places and, mm -hmm. and not because and they are the things like the the wooden benches along the high line or they're they're what um you as a person experiencing space mm -hmm. um connect have an experience with that can transport you um elsewhere if you're looking or paying attention mm -hmm. <laughs> um yeah Feel free to um, uh, add things to the chat or raise your hands, folks. Um, Begun says, oh, great presentation. Thank you. I appreciated the new knowledge gained about one of my favorite places, the High Line. <laughs> I think that this is probably too trick, like it's too big of a question. I feel unfair <laughs> asking it, um, but what do you, I really love this idea of thinking about materials as in motion or and never being a, like having a static state, which is very challenging. I think for me to think about in terms of stone because and because it's, how could it not be anything but solid, but it isn't um, and uh yes uh, so how do you think that that shifts to how design practice um and city building um and, and idea maybe ideas about preservation um if things are not uh, necessary like inert I, that's that's I it's feel that's too hard of a question no yeah. it's, it's like very stimulating um maybe it makes me think about 
you know, work that people are doing to try to think about the rights of, you know, rights yeah, of yeah. Um, rivers and places. Yeah. Um, like not that Giving every person not just for, yeah, yeah not, not everything is, yeah. everything is not just for like a power grab. Mm -hmm. um, and then how, yeah, how does that, how does that shift? I mean, I think for sure people that, this is maybe a little bit romantic, but I think like, you know, people that are really working with those materials have a very strong sense of how they like push back or have openings or, you know, yeah. I imagine that, that you would have a sense of the kind of character the character like it would be hard to think if you mm -hmm. work with it all the time it'd be hard to really think of it as a nerd you did just not mm -hmm. yeah um so yeah I really I I am always I always envy people that have like this, this kind of super deep knowledge because I think they probably have these insights into how alive they really are mm -hmm. yeah I think that really one part of the book that really struck with stuck with me with that is um, this is in the last, and again, the last chapter on Ite would, when you're taking us to the uh, um, Brazilian rainforest and talking about forestry management there. Um, uh, and it's such a, like, it feels, <laughs> there's a design practice too. I mean, ma it's management or, and planning in that um, way, but there's a, this kind of, intimate and intuitive knowledge of the place and, and, and that stewardship feels so, it's so alive. Um, and I would, uh, the, about the kind of a felling of trees being about cutting the tree uh, and extraction, but also about making the, um, um, allowing light in and that, that very careful balance, um, I think is really interesting. And it's, yeah, it's, I think, for me, at least, it's, it's stories like that that you're continually um, bringing to us all, and all these kind of individual people, which I think it is, uh, and uh, large groups of, of people who have not been given voices, and um, like the incarcerated people on Rikers Island that we don't um, have access to, uh, or who are not brought in. Their their participation in this is not um, recognized, and your work really um does that or her, her does the work of, of bringing that forward which is uh I think I was trying to th think what like what is the thing that I find so compelling about that and it's that um like to me as a researcher I'm like there is you can just this is, that is really hard work to be doing that and you it's the care that goes through that is in the way the story is told is really evident um, so I really appreciate that and, and thank you for it. Um, and yeah, I think that's something when uh, I, I'm curious about how that, like how that kind of tenets of care pass on to teaching. Um, as I think that's something that's kind of a little bit as you and Leanne got to, or at least I felt, I'm like, oh, this is, these are people doing that. It, um, in their teaching pedagogy as well. Um, but I think that feels to me like something that is how that gets enacted in practice as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Thanks, Gabby. Um, I have a thank you um, from Rowan. Uh, thank you for this important and informative talk. I'm going away thinking more deeply about extraction, history, slavery, capital scene and the constant remaking of land in service of capitalism. Thanks both uh, Sigun and Rowan for your comments. Well, I think that um, we're, we should wrap things up, um, but thank you very much, Jane. Um, it was, yeah, really wonderful. Um, thanks. thanks to you. stimulating. <laughs> <laughs> Have a wonderful night. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you very much. Take care, everyone. Thanks thank you. Everybody.
Thank you. Just some resounding thank yous in the chat. Bye. Bye.